2022 etymology seminar. Sorry, we're being recorded now. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Dave Crowder. From He's an associate professor at Washington State University, where he also is the director of the Decision Aid System, which is a, a really great IPM tool um, that has real-time weather stations and pest predictive forecasts. Um, Dave's research uh, focuses on, it, it's pretty broad spectrum, uh, wide ranging, but it focuses on landscape ecology, resistance management, IPM, predictive phenological models. Uh, Dave did his master's and undergrad at University of Illinois and his PhD at Arizona. Um, then he went on to postdoc with Bill Snyder at Washington State, where I am pretty sure he just continued on um, at Washington State. So I first became familiar with Dave's work when he published in Nature in 2010 on uh, the impacts of organic pest management on natural enemy communities and pest, and pest control services, um, which was uh, really, uh, really timely because I was working in organic systems at the time. So. Um, and we've been collaborating on and off for, for a couple of years now on stink bug work. So um, it's a real great pleasure to have you here today, Dave. Um, you've changed the title of your talk a couple of times, so I will let you introduce it yourself. I, uh, I, I went back and kept it as what it is on your website. So. <laughs> okay, well now. Um, <laughs> let me share my screen. Dave is also very humble in what he uh, has accomplished. He's mentored over 21 graduate students and nine postdocs. Um, so his his impact is is very broad. Can you guys see this? Yes. Yep, it's working. Yes. Okay. Let me. Well, thanks, Anne. It's a. Uh, it really is nice to be here. Um, I apologize if my kids run in the room. I didn't realize when I scheduled this with Ann last year that my kids were going to be on spring break and we would be in Seattle. So hopefully they won't come in. I think we've got them all set up and, and out the door. Um, but today I'm going to talk about a few different projects we have going on at WSU and involving collaborators in other states um, related to how we manage pests and invasive species and how we kind of turn this into digital tools to kind of deliver information to relevant stakeholders. <clears throat> Oops. Okay. So just very broadly, um, what my lab does, I think can kind of be binned into these two really broad questions, which are how does farm management practices affect the structure of insect communities? And as Anne mentioned, some of this work in my lab has focused on things such as differences between organic and conventional farming systems, trying to understand how the intensity of management practices affects uh, beneficial species and pests and so on. And then, then we try to understand when you get different communities of insects, um, how do they interact in these farming systems and how does that affect outcomes that we as humans care about. So kind of the three areas of study in our lab, I would say are plant pollinator interactions. And I honestly kind of got into this by accident really, because a graduate student was very interested in plant pollinator interactions. And he was one of my first graduate students and took the initiative to write a big USDA grant. And it got funded with no preliminary data. And 10 years later, we're still working on pollinators. So sometimes, I think for those of you that maybe students or postdocs, your career goes in ways that you don't expect if you're flexible and kind of hire good people and they bring good ideas to the lab. Um, the other things we work on that I've kind of always been working on are plant insect pathogen interactions and then landscape ecology and pest management. This is my current grad lab group. We have eight grad students and five postdocs and some number of undergrads, um, but it's a really diverse, uh, exciting group to work with, kind of that spans the spectrum from uh, Shamik here, pretty much is 100% running a molecular biology lab, and Javi and Ping here are people that just work with insects as numbers on a, in, inside of modelers. So we really span a spectrum from kind of hardcore wet lab research to experimental work to modeling. 
I just wanted to give a little background on myself. I know Anne did this uh, just for the people in the room to see, you know, oftentimes I think folks that end up in faculty positions don't have a very straight line in their career. And I was definitely um, one of those people. And I was actually an engineer at the University of Illinois. And I would say I was probably an average engineer and I realized I was an average engineer, but I thought I could be good in environmental science. Um, and so I just decided, hey, I can outcompete these hippies. That was my uh, goal at the time. And I switched to environmental science and I ended up kind of bridging that gap between engineering and environmental science, even though I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And as I was a senior, um, I got asked by a professor to run a monitoring network for soybean aphid all over Illinois. And it was a new invasive species. And to be honest to me, that sounded terrible. Um, driving around Illinois and collecting insects was not what I wanted to do. So I turned down the job. And that professor a few weeks later came back and said, hey, do you want to do modeling on transgenic crops? You know, you have this engineering background. Can you write computer code? And I said, I think I can do that. And so I started back then, it was 20 years ago, genetically modified corn was just coming into the marketplace. And we were really trying to understand uh, how this was going to impact the corn rootworm. And so my very first project in the entomological space actually involved collaborators throughout the Midwest in Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky to try to understand how the Western corn rootworm was moving around and was responding to transgenic crops. So then I went down and did my PhD at Arizona and I was a population geneticist. I was studying insect resistance to uh, insect growth regulators, pyroproxifen, and uh, buprofacin were new kind of chemistries at the time. And white flies were very problematic in Arizona at the time. And these new chemistries had come on the market. And my job was basically to understand whether the insects would evolve resistance to them. And so um, that's what I did my PhD on. And ever since I've moved to WSU, I have done basically nothing related to anything on my PhD or my master's. I don't work on transgenic crops. I don't work on population genetics. I moved very much in an ecological direction. And so trying to understand plant insect interactions and sustainable ag. And as I had kids, I obviously got a lot older in the hair as well. Um, so the major questions my lab works on now and what I'm gonna talk about in this talk are really, can we coordinate area-wide monitoring efforts and use these data for the benefit of pest control? Um, can we make more effective decisions and resource allocations for invasive species? And then I'm really interested in how do we deliver information to stakeholders effectively? Um, I grew up kind of in a farming family, I think this, gravitated me back to the field. And it really does matter to me that we get the information out to the growers and the other stakeholders in an effective way. So one thing I'll talk about today, and Ann mentioned it, is what we've been doing at WSU and my role as the Director of Decision Aid Systems and Digital Agriculture at WSU. And our goal is to link research-based models with real-time data to kind of facilitate delivery of information to stakeholders. And I'll talk about the You muted yourself. It said the host muted me and then I unmuted. Um, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay. So, and then we also have within Washington, you guys may have something at Rutgers. We have a university run weather network and we have an online regulatory database for pesticides. And all of these are examples of different kinds of decision support systems. So the one that I'm most focused on is this platform for tree fruit and potatoes. And I'll, if you're not familiar with a decision support system, um, the one I think is relevant in the North East, although I could be wrong, is the NIWA system that's run out of Cornell. 
Um, North Carolina State used to have a decision support system, but I can't tell if it's still active or if it went defunct. There aren't that many of these throughout the, the country, to be honest, which is a bit surprising. Um, and hopefully you, when you see what they can do, um, I think we should have these kinds of systems in basically every state. And so what our system does is it pulls in environmental data, climatic data from weather stations and from gridded weather forecasts. And then we run those as inputs for a variety of entomological, horticultural and pathology models. And then we have kind of an advanced platform that works on computers and is optimized for the phone to kind of give policyholders um, information for their pest management. And so our system is used on over 95% of the tree fruit and potato acreage in Washington and potatoes in the broader Pacific Northwest. And we average around $75 of savings per acre to the grower across um, probably roughly five or 600,000 acres of crops. So the industries um, say we save them around $40 million a year in reduced pesticide sprays. So this is how our system kind of works. And then I'll show you examples of how we do pest management related to insects and, and other things here. So we have a lot of different stakeholders, researchers in entomology, climate change, horticulture, pathology. We get environmental data from a lot of different sources, including physical weather stations and gridded forecast data. Um, and then we have a big user base of consultants, companies, researchers, growers, both in the Pacific Northwest and up into Canada. So here's what, I, what I'll talk about today is how we can actually translate models of insects and other things into management decisions. And I think as many of you know, the emergence of various life stages of insects and plant po populations are very predictable based on temperature or other environmental factors. And these are phenological models in general that can show when certain life stages are present in the field. Often other times in the entomological space or the agricultural space, we can build models that include some kind of statistical estimation of risk from diseases or pathogens. And the way this is often done is you go out and you sample a lot of fields and you look for where pathogens or insects occur and you build some kind of models to try to explain what are the environmental uh, factors that might promote outbreaks of pathogens. So that's more of a statistical approach, whereas a phenology model is more of a mechanistic um, model that really fits well in most cases. So if you were a user and you were using a decision support system that we run, you could come into the system and all of these are weather stations that are available to users. And so the Washington State Network is very comprehensive. And then the public networks in Oregon and Idaho are less so, but they are really concentrated in the agricultural areas. So this kind of Crescent Moon in Idaho is where almost all of their ag is occurring. And then in Oregon, they kind of have agriculture in the north, in this northwest section, and then way down here in Medford. And so just zooming in in particular areas, this is called the Tri-Cities of Washington. It's on the Oregon border. And so probably from the north to the south of this slide is about 100 miles or so. And you can see there's a pretty good um, density of weather stations here. Then our system also allows folks to come in and if this was my potato farm, I could put what's called the virtual weather station right on my farm. And this will be pulling weather data from a national provider. So those data then are delivered to growers through a series of models. And I'm gonna focus mostly on insects today, but I'm gonna show kind of the comprehensive um, system that we've developed to try to give growers information throughout the year. So tree bloom is one example where 
Um, this is kind of the first thing that growers care about during the year in, in tree fruits is when are the crops blooming? Um, when the crops are gonna be blooming, they have to plan specific labor inputs, pesticide inputs. And so our system can predict when these stages will occur up to 42 days in advance based on the weather data that's occurring at different sites. We also have models of things like pathogens. Uh, Fire blight is a bacterial pathogen. For those of you that work in tree fruits, you're probably familiar with this pathogen. Um, it, the bacteria can be flushed into the flowers with a wetting event, and that is very hard to predict. And once a tree gets infected, you really only have about 24 to 48 hours to get a control on, or that bacterial will proliferate beyond the point of control. And so we have a system that um, predicts when wetness events will occur, as well as uh, temperature, and so we can forecast ahead into time um, when fire blight become, may become a risk for growers. We have models on our site that are related to honeybee foraging. So this was developed in collaboration with Gloria DeGrandy Hoffman. For those of you at University of Arizona. For those of you that work on bees, um, you know that bees fly around based on how much sun it is, how warm it is, they prefer no wind, and they don't like it when it's raining. And so our system pulls in data and all of these environmental factors um, every single day and actually every single five minutes. And it can tell us, for example, you know, if I needed to put down a spray during bloom, the optimal time from a bee's perspective would have been April 13th because it was windy enough and cold enough that they weren't gonna be uh, flying around very much. And so we have all these kind of different models that allow growers to understand different things that are going on in their field. Then I'm gonna move and talk to kind of how we use phenology models for different insects. Codling moth is one of our major pests and this is a, an insect I know is of interest um, to Anne and others in New Jersey as well. And so we are at all times running phenology models for codling moth and outputting to the growers where their insect populations are at in time. And so, you know, here's showing degree day accumulation from the start of the year. Um, you know, if this was the particular date, um, this I was pulling up May 15th last year, but this is what the grower would have seen as 530 degree days have accumulated. Here is what is going on within the population. And then they get management guidelines for both conventional and organic um, management strategies. Just other things that happen in tree fruits include sunburn. This was a huge issue last year where we had that heat dome in Washington where it got up to about 125 in much of the state. And um, again, we have models that can tell growers when their apples are going to be burned and to get specific water treatments down to cool off those fruit. So I'll talk some more about other tools and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus a lot of the remainder of the talk on kind of spatial tools and how we, translate monitoring information of insects to, to growers. Um, but before I do that, I'm gonna also talk about how we've developed some systems to help people actually plan out their pesticide applications um, in real time. And so I probably don't have to explain to this group very much, but the timing of insecticides really matters. And it is my firm belief that in most agricultural systems, a lot of the excess pesticide that is being used is simply because people are not putting their pesticides down at the right times and they're not getting optimal efficacy of those pesticides and therefore they have to spray an additional pesticide. And so here's an example of one of the insects that we deal with is the oblique banded leaf roller. And particular pesticides can treat both the early and the late instars. And so I've highlighted two windows here where a pesticide spray in this first window that maybe is active from about 125 to 250 degree days 
um, would kill the vast majority of the early instars. You can see it's covering almost the entirety of that generation and kill at least the first half of this second uh, the late instars. And so you're getting very good kind of optimal coverage of both stages, whereas a pesticide spray at 500 degree days would basically kill none of the early instars and very few of the late instars. So a spray in this second window would be far too late. And you might say, you know, why would a grower ever spray in that window? And the reason is because growers are out there sampling and if they're not managing things proactively and based on models and an understanding of how these populations are developing, as they're looking for oblique banded leaf roller, they're not even gonna probably see them until the population is peaking, which is happening in this first window. And so by the time you contract out with the guy to spray your field and you get your pesticide product and you load up the tractor and you take a week to spray the field, you might be in this window. And so um, reactive management can really cause folks to miss the optimal timing windows. And this shows just for, um, these are two strategies that are ad advised for codling moth. Delayed first cover is a strategy of trying to get on an oil spray um, when the eggs first start being laid. And then this 425 degree days plus 14 was an old strategy trying to time your insecticides to the first emergence of larvae. And what we've shown is that if you spray a pesticide on exactly the optimal day, um, the average cost per acre can be 100 or even up to $150 less than if you miss your spray timings by two weeks in either direction. And so we really try to get growers as much as possible to identify this kind of five day window around an optimal spray. And you can see if you can kind of get your sprays within five days of when they need to be going on that you're not losing too much money economically. But beyond that, um, we start to see a lot of that waste occurring. So within our system, what growers can do is you can actually come in and I just did this this morning, actually. I picked a station. This is where the WSU research farm is in tree fruits. And I said, hey, it's 2022, and I want to control codling moth. And on average, my first spray goes down on May 16th, and my second spray goes down on July 1st. And what our system then outputs to the grower is how well they are going to be covering that population. And so in this particular case, we're showing, hey, that first spray got on before that those larvae started emerging. You killed a lot of them, but then you had a little bit of a gap where there was some survival, and then the second spray went on, and then we have a gap at the back half of the first generation. Because in tree fruits, there's not a lot of migration in and out of the field. If you kill the bugs in the first generation, they're gone for the full year. So... In this case, you know, I input a couple different pesticide sprays and our system is telling the grower, if you do that, it will reduce your insect population by 68%. And then we tell them also what would happen with that spray program if they're also using mating disruption. And in this case, they would reduce their population by 93%. So really within a couple minutes, and now I could go back in and add different sprays. Uh, we have growers that can go in and plan out their pesticide program for the entirety of the year. And so folks have started using these tools last year. Um, we set up work with 10 different growers to evaluate their historical pesticide strategies um, compared to what we would have suggested based on models. And we found that on average, um, they could have saved over $250 an acre um, by using these kind of planning tools. So this is starting to proliferate through our industry, um, very proactive planning of pesticides based on phenological models. 
So last year as well, um, we developed, and this was where a lot of my research lab has been focused is on potatoes, but we developed a new potato decision aid system that really focuses a lot on population dynamics. And so the key pests of potatoes in Washington include aphids and leafhoppers and psyllids, um, species that transmit pathogens, and then herbivores like Colorado potato beetle. And for many years, uh, extension scientists at WSU had been running monitoring networks for insects that looked like what was going on in panel A over here. So every year, um, 30 to 60 sites are monitored from kind of the north down to the south growing region. You might say, hey, what the gap here is a big uh, natural uh, reserve. So there's really no cropland here. And um, so these points really follow the irrigation district. And we started a few years ago taking the, the growers that would say, hey, you know, what if I'm, and I don't know if you guys can all see my map, what if I'm right here? You know, do I have a low pest density, which is in blue, or do I have an extremely high pest density in red? Um, you know, this system maybe doesn't work for me. And so we started translating monitoring data into these interpolations that are shown over here. And this was what we were doing four or five years ago. It still was a bit clunky. Um, but then we started giving this to the growers and saying, hey, if you're anywhere in the state, we can predict a risk index for this particular pest. And how this works is through a technique called interpolation. Uh, if you sample at different locations, you can basically, if you want to predict this circle in green, you just take a weighted average of the sites where you actually sampled. And so this relies on the idea that insect populations, other populations are spatially correlated. And so this site nearby my predicted location that had a lot of bugs is probably more realistic than this site further away. Um, and I'll just show you last year, how did this look? We've, we've really advanced this site a lot. These pins on the map are weather stations that I've subscribed to. Um, I can't do this in real time because this is a PowerPoint, but if I was in the system, I could click anywhere on the map and it would give me information about what the bug population is doing. It would show me historical comparisons to how the population is tracking compared to last year and it would give me management advice. So like these are just the weather stations that I am personally subscribed to. A lot of them are outside of this modeled area because they're related to tree fruits. But what you can see here, starting last year, we were tracking potato psyllid. Um, this was June 4th. Um, throughout all of our region, we weren't really finding much of it. Two weeks later, we were just starting to see populations move in. This is an area called Mattawa, where we always see bugs in first. They move in from this natural reserve, and there's a huge elevational change, and they fly down, and they land here in this ag area. So it's almost always the first place where we see outbreaks, and we can track that and pass the information to growers on when the bugs are coming. So two weeks later, we saw our predictable first outbreak in this region, um, and you can start to see then the populations were moderate around, but they still hadn't kind of reached the northwest, the northeast part of our zone. And then things started to spread, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just going to click through, you know, every week we're updating new information to growers. Um, that is building on kind of the historical information to tell them where the insect populations are occurring and where management um, needs to be applied. We're also doing this in Oregon and Idaho through collaboration. So these folks are entering data into our system as well. And um, that's how we're getting information out to all of the production area in Eastern Oregon and Idaho and then in Northern Oregon as well. So again, if you were in our system and you clicked on a location, you would see something like this, and it's combining a phenology model and saying, hey, 35% of the adults have emerged from the overwintering site. Here's when they're going to be dispersing into your fields. Um, and then it gives you a recommendation that's based on the degree days and the pest abundance um, for both a conventional or an organic strategy. 
So if you were looking at this on the phone, um, the map would look like this. And then as you scroll down, you would see the recommendations like this. So our platform, and this is something that folks have been really interested in lately, we actually allow users to do their own area-wide management. And so this is that Mattawa region I mentioned, and we, this is actually made up data here, but then I'll show some real data. If you imagine that these gray points are sampling locations that a grower has, we have a very simple template where if you have latitude and longitudes and the number of insects, then it will produce a spatial map that shows you where those insect populations are most abundant in your field. And so this was, these were data from one of our consultants that we worked with last year, and they were able to kind of map this out. And there was really just a couple of old um, storage piles and bins here and here that were promoting their codling moth problem. And they were able to treat that. And then this year they haven't had any problems. And so like growers more and more in our consultants um, are using these kind of tools to enter their own data um, and to visualize it on their own farm. And this doesn't work just in Washington. This kind of system works anywhere in the world. Um, I do want to mention, though, something that kind of trips up some of our growers. And as I'm going to move more into talking about population dynamics here, um, a phenology model is not the same as population dynamics. And I want to give an example of codling moth phenology. And we've had a lot of confusion from growers because we tell them that this is the phenology model for codling moth and it's predicting egg hatch. And this is showing the first generation. So codling moth eggs start to emerge around 375 degree days. And then they have kind of a long emergence curve. And the growers use traps to catch the insects. And we started to be telling them what they might actually see in those traps and that it's not always going to match up with that phenology model. Because here's an example of a grower that might catch 5% of all the insects in their orchard, which is way higher than I think anyone ever would do. Um, but even then you can start to see, these are simulations of what a grower might see. And we see it tracks that phenology model, but you start to get some of that variability. This is what a grower might see. And you see that perfectly blue line in the background, that's the phenology model. But this is what a grower might see in their orchard if they catch 1% of the insects, which is still probably a pretty high number. And you know, certain growers had caught all their bugs by 750 degree days and started catching them right at the beginning. And other growers didn't even catch their first insects till 650 degree days. So, you know, if there is work on phenology models and population dynamics at Rutgers or other places, you need to keep in mind that a phenology model is really a mechanistic. It, I don't want to say perfect, but a phenology model is, if you can measure the weather, is very, very predictive of the insect uh, emergence, but that does is not necessarily what you're going to see in your trap catch. Um, here's what a grower might see if they actually do good management, if mating disruption or an early season pesticide spray wipes out part of their population, they won't actually catch it and they won't start catching the insects until the insecticide residues go away. So we've been working a lot with growers to help them relate the phenology models and when things are happening to their actual trap catch data. And I'll show you kind of just one example here. Any of you that have ever worked in agriculture and done monitoring of insect have probably seen data that looks something like this. Um, so these are Ligus bugs from last year monitored over 45 sites. What do you need? Um, monitored. And if you look at this, it's really hard to kind of infer what the phenology of the pest is or even figure out which one of these fields has worse pest damage potential than the others. And so probably many, many of you have seen insect monitoring data that looks really messy like this. 
But if you take the same data and translate it into a cumulative proportion, this is kind of the idea of a phonology, you can start to see more of a pattern in the data. Again, it's highly variable, but you know, we can start to see all these accumulation curves going from 0% of the bugs collected to 100% and start figuring out what's going on. So these are exactly the same data again, but translating weekly counts to cumulative counts can be a very effective way to model data in an ag system. And again, these are the same data translated into cumulative insects. And so what we do within our system is we track every site and we start to, we, we are pulling in data every single week and then making a forecast of where that population is going. And the goal is, you know, how early in the season can we identify this population that's going to reach a really high level as opposed to this population. But I think what you can hopefully see here is that when you start translating weekly data into cumulative data, it starts to make a little more sense. It starts to look less variable and we can really start to apply um, models to the data a lot more easily. So just an overview here, and then I'm gonna just transition for the last 10 minutes or so to talking about um, how we do some of this for invasive species as well. But Related to decision aid systems, uh, hopefully I've shown we've created a system with regional relevance for tree fruit and potato and other vegetable crops that really links weather data with pest models and monitoring to deliver real-time information to growers and help them forecast um, future situations. So we really are, there was a good paper that came out in PNAS a few years ago that was talking about ecological forecasting. And it said that unlike in the world of weather, uh, so in the world of weather forecasting, they've been building forecasts for many, many years. And they started off and the forecasts weren't that good, but they just kept building them. Um, in agriculture, the case has been made that people have not been doing forecasts because they're worried that they're not perfectly precise. Um, but I still think these forecasts are valuable and that we should be producing them. And that was the argument in the PNAS paper as well, that we're really lagging in agricultural and pest management because we're not making forecasts because in theory, they're not perfect. So the last uh, few minutes uh, here, I'll talk about how we do some of this stuff for invasive species. And many of these tools that we have for agricultural pests apply, you know, phenology models, monitoring networks, and the ability to translate monitoring data uh, into actionable information. So I couldn't give a talk here without showing some of Anne's stuff, um, but I will talk about this BMSB project that we've been working on and Anne's group, for example, has developed phenology models for BMSB, and I believe that they are produced within this uh, NEWA system, and growers can go on and see degree days and forecasts. These are the phenology models from Anne's work and looking at different regions, and again, showing kind of the overlap of some of the life stages and Anne and many others within the BMSB project have done a really good job of relating um, when pesticide sprays are, are most effective based on these phenological information. So we have a base phenology model for BMSB through the work of Anne and others. Um, on top of that, we've conducted nationwide monitoring for this pest as part of an SCRI project. Um, and this is the largest standardized network I've ever been a part of, where everyone was using the same trapping materials, the same trapping protocol, um, putting their traps at the interface of natural habitats and crops, and basically doing weekly sampling all year long. And so in 2017, we had 276 unique sampling sites monitored every week by 26 research groups in 18 states really an amazing uh, group of scientists. Um, <clears throat> 2018 was similar and 2019 was similar and I didn't have a slide for 2020. 2020 was a little reduced because of COVID, but um, was similar in a lot of ways. 
And we take all these monitoring data and then we can say, hey, what really drives outbreaks of brown marmorated stink bugs? So we can build models that look at climatic and landscape factors. And this was one of our preliminary uh, results that predicted the suitability of habitats for stink bugs all across the country and then how they're gonna change over time. And so for you all, it's just gonna get worse and worse and worse. Um, same for us in the West, but those of us down in kind of the, the mid-Atlantic and the South are actually gonna see BMSB problems get alleviated over time um, because it's gonna to get too hot for them. Um, we can also build models state by state. And we've done this in states like Washington and I'll show New Jersey. This is our model of New Jersey and where is it a good place to be a stink bug in New Jersey? Um, I'm embarrassed, I don't totally know where Rutgers is, but I think this is Newark. I think this is where you guys are. So you guys are in the top of the state, I think, and you're in the BMSB hotspot. And then as you go down um, further south, um, I'm not totally familiar with what the habitat or climate is down in the south that's causing this difference, but um, it's not as good of a place to be. I'm guessing it's less urban down there. Urbanization is a big factor with BMSB. And, um, but yeah, state by state now, we're delivering information to folks on where these populations are most likely to be, and hopefully they can plan their sampling accordingly. And then we actually built these kind of models for quote unquote new states where stink bugs had not really been found at the beginning of the project. Um, and I'm showing Missouri because I was on sabbatical at Missouri and was working with some folks there. And we built these kind of maps to show uh, where BMSB would do well in Missouri. And um, a lot of the state is suitable, but the urban areas are really where it's most suitable. Um, more recently, we've been trying to take these techniques and model where biological control might be most effective. So along with the nationwide monitoring network for BMSB. We've done monitoring of its main parasitoid and an entomopathogen fungi. And we can create these maps that show where these species overlap, where the populations of each species are doing the best. Um, and kind of you can infer where biological control might be the strongest from this type of approach. Um, I think one of the last things I'll talk about here is it's really been a goal of ours to guide monitoring of invasive species with these models. Um, when we go out and we sample for invasive species, we often do it in our backyard or in areas that we're familiar and not necessarily the areas that are the most suitable for the insect. And so the black dots here are showing where sampling for BMSB is occurring in Washington state. Um, none of it is happening here in Western Washington where we predict they have a really highly suitable area. Basically none of it is happening down in this Portland area. Um, but then a lot of it is happening through this corridor where we have tree fruit researchers and then just a tiny bit of kind of opportunistic collection in Spokane or Walla Walla. Um, what we've done within our lab is built these algorithms to optimize sampling. And what they do is if you have occurrence records for an insect and you can build these suitability models, which are fairly straightforward to build, um, you can actually figure out in any given state where the pest might be most abundant. Um, and we refine kind of continental models with local habitat data. And then once we have a model for an insect, what we can actually do is define a sampling area that we want to work in. And we have created an algorithm that will identify patches that are the most likely to contain the insect. And a patch that's most likely to contain the insect is highly suitable for the insect and it's also big. And so we identify all kinds of potential sampling patches. And then it actually runs it onto a map and spits out a route and says, hey, if you have 14 sampling locations for stink bugs, these are exactly where they should go 
for you to catch the most insects or have the greatest opportunity to catch insects. And um, we have a paper in revision in methods in ecology and evolution showing this. Um, the red dots down here are where sampling actually occurred for stink bugs. The black and white line and the yellow dots are where we would have suggested sampling occurred. So we wouldn't have gone up at all up into this region or through here based on an optimization model. And we show that the further away that the root actually deviated from our optimal root, the fewer insects they collected. And so we have a technique now that we're, we're using in Washington to guide monitoring of multiple different insects where we're kind of building a sampling route and using that as our baseline for where to go collect the insect. Um, this is the example that we're using for Asian giant hornet. Um, when this species first came in, my lab published a paper in PNAS on the potential distribution of this species. And then we've worked with people at the Washington State Invasive Species Council and the Washington State Department of Ag to really filter out and figure out what is suitable habitat for uh, Asian giant hornet and build a monitoring network around that. So this is what's happening this year. My final, I don't know if you guys have heard of this species. It was a big problem up in the Northeast, uh, European green crab, and it just invaded uh, Washington recently. And the governor just allocated about 10 million to control this species because it's been so problematic so quickly. But this was a process that took us about 30 minutes. And I just want to show how it works. You go in and you collect all the occurrence data on this species. And this is everywhere that it's ever been located and entered into a record. Um, from that, you can build a very simple suitability map. Um, there are many different kinds of modeling techniques that you can use to build a suitability map. And so I've shown the suitability in the Northeast and the Northwest. We can kind of refine those maps. And then this was our initial output of where sampling should occur for this species in Washington. And so this is kind of just a guideline of the highest suitable, you know, most problematic areas that either we need to focus our sampling or our uh, mitigation efforts. And so every time you're dealing with an invasive species, you don't have a lot of information. And as much as possible, you want to try to allocate those resources for monitoring and eradication as effectively as possible. And we think this might be a good way to do it. So conclusion on this side is we really built a platform that I think can aid in coordinating monitoring for any invasive species. We have both scientists, citizen scientists, and volunteers that can enter data that we can assimilate. Um, and used to quickly build models that then guide early detection and eradication efforts. And we are really interested in other folks that may have monitoring data to see how widely this, this technique works. So with that, um, I guess I forgot an acknowledgement slide, but I have everyone to thank in my lab and lots of different collaborators who have helped us collect data and build models, um, deliver information to stakeholders. And it's been really kind of a fun effort that I think, you know, is gonna be a focus for my lab in the next five to 10 years and really looking to build on these decision support systems. So with that, I'll take any questions. Maybe I'll stop sharing so I can see the room. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, just shout it out or you could type so it I, in the chat. Hi, hi, how are you doing, David? This is Dina Fonseca. I'm, I'm with Dr. Hamilton, um, sort of the organizers of the seminar. So I'm, let me just say to the students um, to go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question because it'll make it easier. You know, that little thing on the, on the, on the reactions. Yeah. Um, so that you can call on on anybody with a question, but of course I have a question. So go ahead. Um, so I work with invasive species, mostly mosquitoes and things like that. But one of the big assumptions you're making in this, just the model you talked about for the um, the giant uh, Asian giant hornet, is that there's no that the populations that came in are characteristic of the populations that you're seeing 
And, and we've had a huge problem with that. For example, for Asian tiger mosquito, where there's actually temperate and tropical populations. So if you look at the, in the known distribution, there's in, in, inherent diversity in those populations that are not gonna be reflected in those that came in. How are you gonna be squaring that particular circle? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, and I'm gonna, so there's a couple ways that I think we're trying to square that. The issue that you bring up is really important. And just, you know, if there are student, the, the issue that Dina brings up is, you know, oftentimes when we build um, these species distribution models, we're relying on conditions in the native habitat and projecting them onto the invaded ha habitat. And if the species goes through a bottleneck or adapts or, you know, has any kind of change in their, their niche, um, then the prediction in the native or the invaded region might be wrong, I think is what you're saying, Dina. So we're going about that in two ways. How do we deal with that? But it that? doesn't Number have to be changed. I just want to, I know, I know you were on, on getting onto your stride, but I just want to mention that it doesn't have to be any change. It could simply be that the, the subset that came in doesn't have to actually be, you know, technically is a bottleneck, but the, su the subset you came in may not be, maybe an, an exception. Yes. That could be so, why you actually got here because it is an exception. And, and I'll One way, that. and I'll show a, yeah, we are developing more advanced models of this that actually not only take into account the occurrence data. This is a paper that we published um, in ecography last year, and it was on spotted wing Drosophila. That is one way to deal with that, Dina. So you can take the occurrence data and the environmental data, and we are actually using um, Bayesian models that include phenology and insect life tables. So the, the species occurrence models actually take into account the potential for the species to evolve in response to these different variables. And it shows how likely it is for them to evolve outside of different temperature ranges. And so we've shown that these models that can pull in physiological life table data for insects are able to make a lot better predictions than just the pure environmental data. So that's one way we're going about it is actually incorporating insect evolution directly into the models. Um, the second way we're going about it is, and I'll give an example of the BMSB project where this was an issue that we were really worried about. And BMSB has been in China, it's in Asia, it's in Europe, um, it's in the West Coast, it's in the East Coast. There's suggestions that there's been multiple repeated introductions perhaps. Um, so we, the way we deal with that in this insect is we are gonna build models based on all the data and then regional subsets of the data and then see how transferable they are and try to say, hey, does a, a model that incorporates every observation of BMSB, is that what works in New Jersey or do we need a model that's based on just the Atlantic states? And so we're really investigating with a lot of these what's called model transferability and uh, how transferable are the models across space, and then considering what data we use as inputs for the model. So I guess that's a long-winded answer. We never just build one species distribution model. And the third way we deal with Adina is, yeah, we, we use a lot of ensemble modeling where we're having like six to eight different models, and then we're taking the averages of them to try to get around any problematic assumptions that are associated with a particular model type. And so your question is very valid and like we think about it all the time, okay. and, but those are three ways that we kind of deal with it. And, and I want to, um, Shannon has his, his hand up, so I want to give him the opportunity um, and we, we're going to end, uh, we're going to have an hour afterwards after, so starting at uh, noon, just talk with the students. So um, those students that have questions, we can sort of wait a little bit to, so that others attending the seminar um, can, so, so the students are taking the class can wait a little bit, but Shannon, go ahead. Sorry about that, took me a second. Um, thanks, David, that was a great talk. Uh, I actually work in private industry in, uh, 
import export commodity fumigations. So it's kind of the post farm gate um, in the in the logistics chain, the supply chain of perishables. Um, and, and specifically, we work with things like uh, citrus psyllid on citrus in Southern California, exported to China, as well as like major imports like table grapes coming in from Chile, where we worry about things like Bravipalpus mite and Lobesia and whatnot. And the one question I have for you is, the USDA APHIS is actually re-looking at a lot of these things. Um, we work in fumigation and uh, methyl bromide, of course, is, is really being looked at. Um, seriously by the current administration as well as previous min administrations, even within the quarantine pre-shipment system. Um, my, so they're coming up with these models that, that were, like Chile just put together a thing they call the systems approach, which is an idea of an expansion of integrated pest management post farm gate at ports um, so that when it comes in, it goes through this verification process of sanitation and, and whatnot in order to reduce the, the, net, the need for fumigants, which is a good thing. Um, so they've come up with these, these um, re-looking at a lot of their uh, pest risk analysis, specifically for import pests that have significant risk for domestic agricultural crops like grapes. And a lot of them are actually, you know, they break it down by the different parts of the invasive process, whether it's establishment, uh, risk of, of, of escape, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my question for you is, I was really interested in the way that you were looking at these, these modeling systems to actually show risk of different areas. And one of the things that's in those pest risk analyses that they do actually looks at what is the likelihood that you can have a successful escape and, and establishment on a domestic crop. Um, I'm, do you know if the USDA is using your work or similar work to actually look at that risk level by geography? Because I, I think that that's actually a critically important component. And I'm not sure if that's actually utilized in the most recent versions of the risk analyses that I've read. Yeah, I, I, um, I think it's used in some cases, but not many. Like, I, I don't think you're wrong about that. We had a, um, a recent task grant, which you're probably familiar, are you familiar with task, like the technical assistance for specialty crops, and it was all focused on crops of export concern. And yes, we were using these types of models to define areas of high press prevalence, areas where we needed to do sampling. Um, so yeah, we've been doing this a lot for export pests in Washington in collaboration with Lisa Nevin's group. Um, and that has been funded by USDA, but I don't think it's incorporated into their broader strategy per se. Does that answer your question? Like, it yes, does. we've, we've it done does. it regionally, that, but, and I'd love to do it with more groups, but it doesn't seem like every group is doing this kind of stuff. It seems like a lot of the work that I see is just monitoring. You know, yep. USDA APHIS funds lots of those surveys, and we're trying to turn those surveys into more models and actual real-time information that can be used to make these kind of decisions, but it's not being done in most cases. I'm going to be with Dr. Jin and, and Dr. Jeffers, uh, the PBQ group, um, two weeks from now, and um, I, I, I'm actually going to bring up your work here because I think it's actually a critical component for their analyses that, that we're missing. So thank yeah, you. I'd love to. Yeah, if you have any follow ups, please email me because we're really interested in testing this out with more people that have data. And like I said, it doesn't take us very long to build preliminary models. And then we like to pass them back to the people that actually know something and say if they're garbage or if they make sense or whatnot. <clears throat> but yeah, this is something that we have the ability to scale, I think, very easily. Thank you. Right, it's it's twelve o'clock, and so um, do we want to give five minutes, or just we can just keep on going so we don't lose a stride. Great job, Dave. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. So there. No problem. Thank you all for attending. <laughs> thank you. For I have a gazillion questions, but we 